Developing right now on Morning News Now, a split screen of extreme weather ushering in the first official day of summer. In Texas, millions of people already feeling the impacts of tropical storm Alberto. This morning, entire neighborhoods flooded with even more heavy rain expected across the state throughout the day. And another day of searing heat nationwide, making conditions worse for firefighters out west. We've got a team tracking it all. Also this morning, questions of conduct on Capitol Hill. Florida Congressman Matt Gates firing back against an ethics committee investigation into allegations of illegal drug use and sexual misconduct. We'll have a look at what else the committee is looking into. Plus, move over Microsoft, chipmaker NVIDIA, now the world's most valuable public company. More on the tech giant's rise to the top and new concerns were entering bubble territory. And a book ban battle renewing the debate over censorship in America with LGBTQ plus issues at the center of it all. In the latest installment of our Proud Out Loud series, how some states and groups are working to ban the bans and keep those books on the shelves. Good morning. Good to have you with us on this Thursday. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment. We begin this morning with the extreme weather that is marching across the country. Later this morning, tropical storm Alberto is expected to make landfall in Mexico. But the system is already battering the Texas Gulf Coast. It is the first named storm of the hurricane season. This is the scene in Brazoria County where Alberto brought up to 10 inches of rain. But the major concern for Texas officials this morning is storm surge. In Treasure Island, much of the town already underwater ahead of Alberto's landfall. But emergency service crews, not much, done, can, not much can be done for them until the water starts receding. Trying to get your ambulance into a lot of these neighborhoods, how difficult is it? It's very difficult. It's impossible. We wouldn't be able to drive uh, into Treasure Island, which is right behind you. There's very few houses we can get to on our own. As Texas braces for more flooding, New Mexico is assessing the damage caused by one of the most devastating wildfires in state history. At least two people are dead, hundreds of structures destroyed. Congressional leaders from that state have called on President Biden to issue a major disaster declaration. And on the East Coast, it is hot, hot, hot. The dangerous heat wave continues to push temperatures well into the 90s, even the triple digits. Relief could be on the way, though, bringing an end to this record-breaking stretch. We have our team standing by, including meteorologist Michelle Grossman, with more on the extreme heat. But first, Corpus Christi Fire Department Chief Brandon Wade joins me now. Brandon Wade, to, for more on Tropical Storm Alberto. Thanks for joining us, Chief. So first of all, walk us through what you are seeing and hearing on the ground right now. Well, good morning, Joe. So right now, the city of Corpus Christi is doing very well. We were assessing conditions and had crews out um, all day yesterday. Um, I think the city just, again, we saw some storm surge that hit a little bit of a low-lying area, but the city fared very well. What is your biggest concern now as Alberto makes landfall? Right, right now, um, what we're looking at is, as the sun's going to rise, is assessing the road conditions, seeing if there's any damage from where the tidal surge came in through the Corpus Christi Bay um we were very fortunate that we had very limited incidents we had a few traffic accidents from uh, the water pooling on the road but i think all in all through the messaging that uh, the city put out uh warning residents about the wind and preparing for the water um i think the citizens you know took heed of that advice and we were very fortunate we didn't have extremely high tides uh, or a, st a storm surge coming in the timing of those tides so important. So we just heard from folks in Treasure Island. They say they're having trouble getting to people who need help. How big of a worry is that for you in Corpus Christi today? And what should people do if they do need assistance today as the storm's rolling through? Absolutely. Well, talking with the National Weather Service, Corpus Christi looks to be uh, kind of on the downhill side of, I think, this uh, the, the event. So Yesterday is where we kind of had our highest concerns if we were going to be able to make it to different areas if we had some uh, storm surge, but we really didn't experience that. So we had maybe two or three walkouts where some cars were in a little bit of higher water, but we were able to access that. And then again, now as we look at it as daybreak comes up, we're just going to go out and start assessing those road conditions 
we closed roads off early too and then warned the residents and again i think a lot of that from the visitors here in town to the residents um, that they took heed of that advice and as always if somebody has that emergency you know we we push them to call 911 early so we can get the response out there and take care of them and then for um, non-emergent events but they're seeing things as water rising on certain roads they can call 311 and put that to the officials and then we can uh, go out and take a look and assess the situation. Let's look at the big picture here. Hurricane season just started nearly three weeks ago. It goes till the end of November. We're already seeing a tropical storm hit the coast. So is Corpus Christi prepared if 2024 is the active storm system that, that is being predicted? Absolutely. You know, as a coastal town, this city has uh, strong plans in place with the city departments. Uh, in which we prepare for hurricanes that could possibly come here. So we have many planning meetings, but also um, there's a, a greater um, relationship that's built with the state of Texas. And as we work with our regional partners, as we work with our state agencies, um, th this goes on. Planning is year round for us here. And that's everything from assessing plans to assessing the resources we have, and then coordinating with our partners here locally. And that's what's going to really build a safe plan and make sure we always have the strong messaging to the citizens what they should do. All right. Chief Brandon Wade, we are thinking of you and your community in the coming hours. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time. You Let's turn out Thank you very much. Let's turn now to that record-breaking heat wave that is scorching the East Coast and Midwest from Michigan to Maine. And for the West Coast, it's officially wildfire season as fires there continue to rage on. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin is here in New York with the very latest. Hey there, we're seeing dangerous conditions nationwide. Out west, those wildfires have turned deadly, killing at least two in New Mexico, scorching 23,000 acres, destroying 1,400 structures, prompting a state of emergency and the evacuation of thousands of residents in Rio Doso, which is about 150 miles southeast of Albuquerque. Meanwhile, here in the northeast, that heat dome continues its dangerous grip with more than 60 million Americans living under heat alerts yesterday. It never has felt hotter in Bangor, Maine, and officials all over the Northeast are taking every precaution, opening up cooling centers in malls and churches. Officials really urging folks to stay inside, to stay safe, and to stay hydrated. Here in New York City, I was speaking to a fire official, and they said that they're already seeing the number of emergency calls go up. He says he expects for that uptick to to continue because when there's a heat wave, they really start to see the calls on day three, day four of the heat wave, and they're bracing for even more. Back to you. All right, Aaron McLaughlin, thank you. From the heat to the tropical storm, a lot to talk about. So let's get a check on your morning news now forecast. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman is here. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Yeah, another really busy day. And we're going to keep it busy over the next several days into early next week in terms of the heat because this heat is not going anywhere. We have that heat dome tacked in place, and we have 65 million Americans in the north from the Great Lakes to the Ohio Valley, also New England, under heat advisories. That is in the orange. Heat watch is in that darker reddish pink color for Philadelphia. Heat warnings for Fort Wayne, Pittsburgh, also Bangor. Aaron had mentioned this, the heat index yesterday so high. We're going to see it high once again today into the triple digits in Bangor. But here are the air temperatures uh, in that black color. And then the box next to it is what it feels like on our body. So as we go throughout the day, it's going to be another day of intense heat. Again, it's that cumulative effect like Aaron had mentioned. We're not getting a lot of relief at night. So that makes it as harder on the body as we go throughout the days and days and days of this. So 92 today in Burlington, it will feel like close to 100 degrees. It's going to feel like 103 in Bangor, feeling like 94 in Boston. So it actually feels a little cooler uh, than the actual air temperature. We'll feel like 94 in New York City. Same story as we head towards Indianapolis, Pittsburgh, Elkins into the 90s. Then on Friday, we're going to keep this in place. We're looking at temperatures again, close to 100 degrees in St. Louis, Nashville, 96, 95 in Roanoke. So many many 90s on the map, so ahead of schedule in terms of those uh, temperatures were 10, even 20 degrees above normal. New York City tomorrow feeling like 95. So you need to stay hydrated over the next several days and find those cooling centers if you haven't already. 
Then as we go into early next week, we're not really getting any relief. Look at St. Louis, Saturday, 99, 97 on Sunday, 96 on Monday. Same stories we had further to the east. Philadelphia near 100 degrees on Saturday and Sunday. And then a little relief, if it sounds like relief at 91 degrees as we head towards Monday. Air quality will be a problem too, especially for the elderly children compromised with asthma, lung and respiratory diseases. 47 million people where you see that orange uh, shading, especially we're gonna have uh, some tough air quality there as well. Let's move it to the tropics because we are about to see landfall of our first named storm, Tropical Storm Alberto. It is 40 miles east of Tampico, Mexico. Winds are at 50 miles per hour and it's moving west at 13 miles per hour. So we will see that landfall shortly. And then once it makes landfall, it's going to interact with uh, some mountainous terrain in Mexico and it's going to dissipate very, very quickly. That's good news for southern Texas. But in the meantime, the rain is falling. We're looking at 3 million people impacted by flood alerts uh, from Laredo to Corpus Christi, Port Mansfield, also Brownsville. We're concerned about flash flooding as well. Not expecting a whole lot more rain, especially once this makes landfall. We're going to kind of see it winding down, which is good news in terms of the wind and also the rain in southern uh, Texas. Western Texas, you'll get a little bit hit harder as we go throughout this Thursday. You see those yellow uh, colorings, the yellow shading in orange. That's indicating where we could see heavier downpours. And we are still seeing some downpours now. The concern will be with that coastal flooding. And then again, I know we talked about this earlier with our guest, uh, but with some of those high tides through Friday. Flash flood risk is getting a little bit smaller, too. That's good news. We have a uh, marginal risk where we're looking at Corpus Christi and also Brownsville. So something to watch as we head throughout the morning hours. And then a whole nother story. We have a front that's going to bring the chance for severe storms, some really heavy downpours uh, with three inches per hour. Some of these storms that includes Minneapolis to Sioux Falls. Also where you see that darker blue, the slight risk, we're looking at some heavy rain as well. So there's the map for today. It's another busy one. So that summer sizzler does continue and looking at that severe storms in the northern tier of the nation. Busy is a key word. Yeah. A little something everywhere. All right, I know. I Michelle. feel like that's going to be the summer. All right. Appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Sure. Tension between the U.S. and Israel are growing. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu openly criticized the Biden administration for allegedly withholding weapons and ammunition. It's a charge that's being publicly disputed by the White House. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has that story. A new and very public breach in a pivotal partnership over the flow of U.S. weapons to Israel. After Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu leveled a stinging accusation, posting a video, notably spoken in English, for an American audience. It's inconceivable that in the past few months, the administration has been withholding weapons and ammunition to Israel. Israel, America's closest ally. Israel says it must defeat Hamas and secure the release of hostages. During World War II, Churchill told the United States, give us the tools, we'll do the job. And I say, give us the tools and we'll finish the job a lot faster. But his charge has been met with surprise at the White House. We generally do not know what he's talking about. In May, the Biden administration publicly acknowledged it paused delivery to Israel of a shipment with 2,000 pound bombs. Responding to Netanyahu's message, Secretary Blinken disputed the prime minister's complaint and said that one armed shipment is being evaluated. Because of our concerns about their use in a densely populated area, like Rafa, that remains other, uh, under review, um, but everything else is moving as it normally would be. Tensions have been evident over a period of months between the president and prime minister. President Biden says he has been direct with Netanyahu about avoiding civilian casualties and negotiating toward a ceasefire agreement. But U.S. officials also say that Hamas's top leader is the big holdout preventing a deal. All right, Kelly O'Donnell, thank you. On Capitol Hill, the House Ethics Committee is continuing its investigation into Representative Matt Gates. The bipartisan panel says it's reviewing several allegations against the Florida Republican, including that he engaged in sexual misconduct, illegal drug use, and obstructed investigations of his conduct. But the committee also says it will take no further action on some other allegations. Gates, a strong ally of former President Trump, denies all accusations of wrongdoing. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Respondent Ali Vitali joins us now. So, Ali, walk us through what exactly the Ethics Committee is looking into right now and which allegations it's no longer investigating. 
It's an important distinction, Joe, because these investigations into Congressman Gates have been going on over the course of the last year or so. The ones that they've since closed over on the Ethics Committee side include the following, and I'll put them up on the screen so that you can see the distinction here. They've cleared Gates at this point of the, the allegation that he shared lewd images or videos on the House floor. They've also said that he did not misuse campaign funds and they're no longer looking into bribery charges, but there are still those allegations on the table that they are interested in and that they are still investigating, as you mentioned, including sexual misconduct allegations and charges of illegal drug use. Those are things that you're right to point out. The congressman denies, but nevertheless, the Ethics Committee is still looking into them. Yeah, how is Gates responding to all of these developments? In typical fashion, he is not just denying them, but doing so with a flourish. He's saying that this is all because the former speaker, Kevin McCarthy, is angry at Gates for the role that Gates played in kicking McCarthy out of the speakership and thusly out of his job last year. This is something McCarthy has not been secret about. The bad blood between Gates and the former speaker is well known on Capitol Hill. McCarthy and Gates both speak openly about how much they dislike each other. But at the same time, Gates is saying it goes further than dislike. He thinks that McCarthy basically put the ethics committee up to it. Of course, that's not our understanding of the situation, but it's part of his denial of the allegations and the things that the ethics committee is looking into right now. Okay, so now we have this update on where things stand. Let's talk about what happens next. How long does this whole process take? What might happen to Gates? This is a really dark process, specifically because it's shrouded in mystery. The Ethics Committee doesn't typically give any updates as to what they're investigating until they've either A, decided to open an investigation, or B, closed an investigation. It's why we have this sense right now of where they are in their inquiries into Matt Gates. But we don't expect many updates in the interim period. They'll finish this when they finish this, and they'll give their report. But until then, it's really just a waiting game. All right, Ali Vitale with this update. Thank you so much. Wall Street has a new top dog. NVIDIA overtook Microsoft on Tuesday to become the world's most valuable public company by market capitalization. That is the total value of all the outstanding shares of stock. The chipmaker passed the lofty $3 trillion mark in early June, becoming only the third member of an elite club that includes Microsoft and Apple. One of the most remarkable things about the company, it has tripled in value in the last year. More, we're joined by friend of the show, Investopedia's editor-in-chief, Caleb Silver. Caleb, good morning. So we all know Apple, we all know Microsoft, but NVIDIA is far less of a how household name. So for those who don't know, tell us a little bit about this company. What do they make and who do they make it for? Yeah, unless you're a big time gamer or you're making your own cryptocurrency, mining your own cryptocurrency or running a data center, you probably never touched an NVIDIA product, but they do make chips high processing chips, GPUs we call them, for gaming originally, and now they're making them for AI. Guess who its biggest customers in the world are? Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, the biggest companies of the world are buying these smart chips from NVIDIA. They've been doing that aggressively over the past few years. It's become the most valuable company, $3.3 trillion. You say it tripled in the past year. Well, since 2021, it's up 627%. Joe, not to give you a FOMO, since 2019, up 3,000. 444%. I'm going to walk you through some even more numbers here. It had a remarkable 170% surge in its share price this year, a more than ninefold increase since the end of 2022. So what is behind this massive spike? Yeah, NVIDIA is not just a company that got here a few minutes ago. The company's been around for about 30 years. Its CEO, a very personable, uh, popular guy named Jensen Wong, created the first GPUs for gaming back in 1990, 93, 1999. The first GPUs came out. Then they started doing parallel processing in the early 2000s. They've been at the forefront of every big technological development, making the chips, making the processors, the things you don't see or touch, but are inside our machines, making them work better. And now they're making chips for AI servers, for big AI server farms, for big hardcore processing. And they've been there for crypto. They've been there for gaming. They got there for AI. They've been at the front of every revolution. And that's why the share price is so uh, high right now. And so many people want to own it. And guess what? If you feel like, oh, I missed buying that stock. I should have bought it five years ago. You probably own it because it's in one of the top holdings in the biggest mutual funds in the world. Ah, good point that a lot of people forget about there. Coach. So your numbers, guys. So we'll throw out some more numbers here in the span of just one year. The tech giant's market valuation. It's gone from $1 trillion 
trillion dollars to more than three trillion. By comparison, it took Apple and Microsoft nearly five years to make that same leap. So what can we learn from this meteoric rise and just how much higher could it go? Yeah, yeah, I mean, infinitely higher, of course, because you can go as high as people want to bid the stock up. But it's important to know there are story stocks that come along every now and then. Tesla was one of them. Amazon was one of them. NVIDIA is definitely one of them. They change the course of technology. They change the way we work. They change the way we operate. And people pile into those shares. It is the darling stock of the moment. And for good reason, it did $60 million, billion, I should say, in revenue last year, but $30 billion in profit. So it's immensely profitable. And what do shareholders, what do investors? Investors want. They want companies that are growing their profits big time over the long term. And NVIDIA has done that really for the past several years. No reason to think it can't keep growing its profits because its customers are the biggest companies in the world and they all want its products. So a lot of people love this company yet outside of Wall Street and the tech sector. Not a lot of people are familiar with it. Is there a possibility that that this could be a bubble? Yeah, it could always be a bubble. And there are people that have been piling aggressively into the stock because it just keeps rising up and to the right. So that happens sometimes and it lets out some steam. But it's important to know this stock split a couple of weeks ago and that there was the share price was about 10 times higher. It split. There are a lot more shares out there. It's a lot cheaper. So a lot more invest investors feel like they can afford it right now, even though you could buy it at any price at any dollar amount. It's split. So it's now more available and it's in a lot more indexes. So I can would imagine it would probably go higher. All right, Caleb Silver with a little NVIDIA 101 for us this morning. Caleb, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, a new chapter in the battle over book bans as a counter movement gains traction. More on how lawmakers and LGBTQ plus groups are working to keep books in libraries and schools. Up first after the break, a setback in space. NASA saying it's delaying the return of the manned Boeing Starliner again. Stay with us. Welcome back. Boeing Starliner capsule is facing another major setback this morning. NASA says it will be delaying the spacecraft's return to Earth once again. Now, two weeks ago, the world watched as the astronauts on board became the Starliner's first crew to successfully dock the spacecraft to the International Space Station. The astronauts were initially set to come back to Earth sometime this week, but the landing now expected to take place next Wednesday. That's six days from now. Joining us for more on this is Leroy Chow. He is a former former NASA astronaut and an International Space Station commander. No one better to talk with about this. Leroy, good morning. So the Starliner was initially supposed to be docked at the ISS for just about a week. Now the departure has been considerably pushed back. NASA and Boeing say they're looking into thruster issues and helium leaks. Walk us through these issues. I mean, how worrisome are they? Sure. Well, as you know, Starliner has had its problems in development. Boeing as a company has been having a lot of problems, not only on the space side, but especially on the commercial airplane side. So a lot was riding, is rising, riding on this mission. Uh, Butch and Sonny finally launched on June 6th. They had a, a what looked like a flawless launch. They launched with what it was an existing small helium leak that NASA and Boeing decided that was uh, something they could live with. Once they got into orbit, though, then they quickly uh, you know, developed four more leaks. They had five thrusters fail on the way to the ISS, but they successfully docked. Um, all of these problems were fairly minor in the big scheme of things. Uh, they've now cleared four of the five thrusters to be turned back on for the return flight. The helium leaks remain small. They are continuing to be looked at by NASA and Boeing. But basically, NASA said, look, we could tolerate leaks that are 100 times worse than these, so we should be okay. The reason for the delay, they're being extra conservative, extra cautious. Uh, they don't want to be complacent. And also, because the leaks are in the part of the vehicle that detach and burns up in the atmosphere, Boeing and NASA won't get the, the part back, the piece back that has the problems. And so they're trying to determine as much as possible now while the vehicle is still docked, looking at telemetry, uh, you know, probably cycling some valves open and closed, just to learn as much as they can uh, before this trip, the, the, the two astronauts come back down. Let's talk about those astronauts, SUNY Williams and Barry Wilmore. They've now been at the International Space Station since June 6th. Uh, they know it. They know it fairly well. But how common is it for astronauts to have to unexpectedly extend their stay there? Uh, it's not super common. Usually the uh, schedule is fairly, um, you know, fixed. Uh, the exception would be the long duration stays. Sometimes those will get delayed. 
uh, you know, maybe a day or two or maybe even a few days because of weather conditions, the landing site, or for some other reason. Usually it's not for any technical issue with the spacecraft, um, you know, but so it's not not uncommon, but it's not super common either. So if all things go to plan, what happens next now once this part of the mission is complete? Right. So if all goes to plan on uh, the 26th, Butch and Sonny will come back. They'll likely have a nominal, uh, you know, deorbit burn and entry. Uh, you know, will it'll detach. The capsule will detach, come back through the atmosphere, and they'll safely land back on Earth. After that, Boeing is going to and NASA will be uh, again going over all the data, proposing fixes, putting some fixes in place for the next flight, and going through extensive testing. You can bet a lot of uh, a lot of help from NASA. You can bet as well. Uh, but I'm confident they'll figure it all out, and uh, they'll have the next flight should be hopefully flawless. In the end for Boeing, has this been a step forward despite all the setbacks? Uh, you know, it, it's been a step forward in that they successfully got the vehicle into uh, into orbit. Uh, but, you know, these contracts were let 10 years ago, and uh, the idea was that NASA wanted more than one provider for redundancy, and they, SpaceX was the big unknown. They had never uh, done spacecraft before, uh, even though Boeing was almost twice as expensive. Boeing was kind of the backup, right? Well, SpaceX ended up being first. They got there almost three years ago. They've been flying NASA astronauts for close to three Three years, uh, Boeing playing catch up. So yes, it is a step forward, but uh, they they kind of lost a lot of steps uh, along the way during the development. All right, Leroy Chow, appreciate your expertise. Thanks for joining us this morning. Now to what's making headlines around the world. Russian President Vladimir Putin has arrived in Vietnam for a state visit there. NBC News international correspondent Claudio Lavanga is in Rome with that and other world news. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joe. That's right. Vladimir Putin received a very warm welcome upon his arrival in Vietnam early on Thursday morning. But the timing of his visit is also very important because it comes literally less than a year after President Biden traveled to Vietnam to strengthen relations uh, with the U.S. And about Putin's visit uh, to Vietnam, a State Department spokesperson told NBC News, and I quote, that no country should give Putin a platform to promote his war or of aggression and otherwise allow him to normalize his atrocities. Putin's trip to Vietnam comes after his visit to North Korea, where he and Kim Jong-un pledged to come to each other's aid in case of an attack and brought relations between the two countries to a whole new level, especially in regards to security and military cooperation. Now over to England, where the Stonehenge monument was vandalized with orange spray paint by climate protesters. The vandals representing the group Just Stop Oil and said the act was in response to the Labour Party's recent election manifesto. They were arrested on suspicion of damaging a world-famous prehistoric monument. The incident comes literally just before the summer solstice, when thousands are expected to gather at the site to celebrate the longest day of the year. And finally, Naples, an ancient beach, is once again open to the public. The beach at the Herculaneum Archaeological Park was destroyed nearly 2,000 years ago after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, the destroyed also nearby Pompeii. The famed site reopened Wednesday after years of excavations and restorations and found to be highly useful for research. Uh, its most important find was a skeleton of a 40-year-old man and his belongings that was just discovered back in 2021. Joe. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Coming up behind bars and unjustly treated, families in Michigan taking two counties to court over a ban on in-person jail visits. When we come back, more on the legal fight that's raising questions about civil rights. Plus, LGBTQ groups working to turn the page on a growing effort to ban books. More on the counter movement to keep those stories on the shelves. You're watching Morning News Now. We're back with a legal fight in Michigan. Two counties are being sued, accused of violating the civil rights of people with family members in jail by banning in-person visits to incarcerated relatives. The current policy also forces families to pay for what can be expensive video calls. As part of our NBC News Justice for All series, Nightly News anchor Lester Holt spoke exclusively to the sheriff in one of those counties about his plans to change this policy. There are thousands of people in county jails in this country awaiting trial, many unable to see their children in person, instead forced to pay for video visits. 
Now that money-making policy is being challenged. One lawsuit filed in Flint, Michigan, where I sat down with a defendant in the case who tells me he's had second thoughts about a policy he once embraced. Hello, how you doing today? What begins as excitement ends in tears for Rakila Harris Dudley and her children. Don't cry. Separated by less than two miles and by a jail policy that doesn't allow in-person visitation. Rakila's parents, Philip and Brenda, have been caring for her children. Every day, where's mama when she's coming home? It must have made for um, some rough moments with the kids. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I said, well, right now, Granny's mommy, and I'm going to hold you until you feel better. Replacing free in-person visits with costly video calls has become the norm in hundreds of jails across the country. Here, a 25-minute call typically costs $10. It just costs too much, and it's not even guaranteed that it's going to work. Now, the policy is at the center of two lawsuits in Michigan, including one of them here in Genesee County, which is fighting it, arguing there's no constitutional right for in-person visitations. But civil rights attorney Alec Carrick-DeSantis disagrees and says video-only visits are painfully inadequate. We think there's a constitutional right for children to hug their parents. The video calls are operated by for-profit telecommunications companies, but counties like Genesee get to pocket some of the revenue. Caracasantis calls it a kickback scheme. The theory behind these contracts seems to be if you stop kids from visiting their parents in person, these desperate families will be forced to spend more money on phone and video calls. This is Rakila's first time in jail. She says her son's father physically abused her for years, leaving this scar. She's accused of violently retaliating against him after she says he attacked her in February. It was a fight or flight moment. I never thought that if I would do anything like that. Rakila couldn't afford bail, so this screen is the closest she can get to seeing her children. How does it feel that someone is making money off this? It feels disheartening. It feels criminal. I feel it's greed. <laughs> greed. Sheriff Chris Swanson runs the jail and was a strong supporter of the policy when it began 10 years ago. He is personally named in the lawsuit. How much money is the county making from video visits right now? Over 400000 What was the reasoning behind it? money. When I became the undersheriff in 2010, uh, we had to cut 10% of our budget. But when it came to the revenue, it was very attractive, and it still is to sheriffs across the country. But we're going to change that. And by change that, Sheriff Swanson meant now. In our interview, he told me that he believes he made a mistake, and regardless of how the court rules, he says he's reversing course, reinstating in-person visits starting next month. We're going to return to in-person visits, and we're going to reinvest our revenues back to lowering costs for jail calls and video visitations. You're going to be leaving money on the table. It's money I don't need, and it's money that doesn't come from the inmates. It comes from their families. And so you're penalizing people, and I see that now. You were one of the guys that was a proponent of ending in-person visits, and now you've made this, this, this yeah. giant turn here. It's because the person that I am today is not the same person I was in 2012, 2014. But not long ago, you were, you were celebrating the dollars coming in. I accept that. Why did it take a lawsuit, though, to, to make this turn? It didn't have to. But it did. It did. After spending more than 100 days in jail, Rakila finally made bail last week, able once more to hug her children unlike thousands of others in jails across the country. The Flint case is back in court next week, but no matter what happens, Sheriff Swanson says he is committed to restoring in-person visits, and he is inviting other sheriffs to join him. All right, Lester, thank you so much. Now for another special conversation for our Pride Month series, Proud Out Loud. Today, we're looking at the political battle over what you can read at the library. The nonprofit organization, PEN America, says that there have been more than 4,000 recorded instances of book bans in the first half of this school year alone. 
many of those books dealing with racial issues, LGBTQ plus themes, and sexual violence. Well, this morning, a look at how some states and organizations are fighting back against those bans. We're joined by the executive director of the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, Melanie Willingham Jaggers, and Minnesota State Representative Lee Finke. Thank you both for joining us. Melanie, we're going to start with you. So to counter some of these book bans, your organization launched the Rainbow Library. Tell us about that. That's right. So in uh, 2019, um, one of our chapters in Connecticut, um, sorry, <laughs> it's, it's early in the morning. No, I, I understand. It's it my brain every single <laughs> yeah, morning. No, so absolutely. a chapter in Connecticut. Yeah, a chapter in Connecticut launched this program. Uh, and starting from just one school and one library, we are now in over 35 states, reaching over 5 million students. And what can you find in these libraries? Is it meant to be like because a community doesn't have certain books, but you can find them here? Yeah, so this is free of charge to teachers and librarians. Um, and each set has 10 books in it. Um, and each of those books um, represent, show the diversity of our world, diversity of our communities and our families. And so you'll have LGBTQ plus um, characters. You'll have one book in every set that's in a language besides English. So that's really cool also. Um, so yeah, we love it. And what's some of the response you're hearing? So what we're hearing from educators um, and parents is that they love it, right? It really is a way to make sure young people are seeing themselves in the curriculum, and that's what we know makes sure that young people stay in school and are successful. Okay. We're also getting pushback. Um, we can talk about that another time. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, what's some of the pushback you hear? Yeah, I mean, this is what we're seeing across the country are book bans, um, and they understand what works, right? Our opposition understands what works for young people, um, and they are about the business of removing supports and putting barriers in their way. So people are often challenging um, the arrival of our of our library sets um, and we are meeting them with even more sets. Representative Finke, let's talk a little more about book bans. Just last month, your state of Minnesota passed a bill banning book bans in public schools libraries. We've seen a few states do this over the past year, the momentum sort of shifting in this way. Why was this so important to you? Do you think it will be a blueprint for other states to follow? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I do believe so, right? I mean, it's important to me as um, a trans person, as a person who is an author of a book that has been challenged um, in states, in the United States, that we continue to make sure that young people are able to find a representation of who they are, no matter who they are, wherever they are, right? And for a lot of young people, especially queer people, um, we find ourselves first in the library. So, so not having the ability to even find a simple book um, who can help us, that can help us answer questions about who we are and how we're feeling is incredibly, incredibly damaging. Um, so in Minnesota, uh, under the leadership of Representative Cedric Frazier, who is the chair of the Posse Caucus, uh, the Posse and Queer Caucuses really pushed this bill that said, we need to make sure that we are not allowing preferences of individuals, um, The to allow certain subject matters to be pulled just because that's the, the desire of certain individuals. So we put in this law that banned the ability of individuals to, re, uh, to pull books from the library. So Melanie, we often hear those who support these bans, they say they're getting rid of materials they say are obscene or pornographic. So when you look at the books that are being banned, is that the case? Do you ever see things that you think are truly obscene or, or what's the reality you're seeing? Here's the reality, is that educators are trained, right, around developmentally appropriate curriculum. And we trust educators. And so all of our books um, are developmentally appropriate, are vetted by educators, are chosen by educators. And what we have in our Rainbow Library set, which we have them available from K to 12. And so there's a set for, you know, kindergarten to second grade and then so on up, right? You're not going to send a, a youth, um, a YA novel to a kindergartner, right? Um, and what we're, what we're finding is exactly what Representative Fink said, which is that young people find themselves in what they're learning. And so we find it really important to ensure that they can see themselves and what, what they're being taught. Because we know that that's what keeps them in school, that's what helps them complete, that's what helps them be successful in life, and that's what helps them be ready to be um, participatory and powerful members of our democracy. So Representative Finke, I'll ask you this question for those who who have been making this argument that they're trying to get rid of things that they say are obscene. What's the message you have for them? In your mind, what is a better solution in dealing with these conversations? I mean, the answer is that when you are trying to keep kids from being who they are, you are trying to keep kids from being um, 
someone like myself, right? Like the adult queer people in the world, um, all kinds of diverse individuals in the world. When we go to the library and we remove the books that represent who we are, we are telling kids that being who you are is wrong, is fundamentally incorrect. And you shouldn't, not only should you not be uh, one of those people, but you shouldn't even learn about who those people are. Uh, we need to move the conversation towards one of inclusiveness, one of pluralism, one of understanding diversity and um, the wide range of human experience is a part of what education is all about. And that's the conversation we need to have. We need to stop censoring identities. We need to stop censoring histories and we need to start celebrating all of us. All right, Melanie Willingham Jaggers and Representative Lee Finke of Minnesota, thank you both for your time this morning and this important conversation, appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, Democrats and Republicans teaming up to take on the technology that generates deep fake pornography. More on the efforts on Capitol Hill to put an end to this troubling trend. That is next on Morning News Now. We're back with a huge money laundering bust by the Department of Justice. U.S. officials announced charges against 24 people. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky reports on the investigation known as Operation Fortune Runner. Troubling global ties following a massive money laundering bust. Authorities connecting Mexico's infamous Sinaloa drug cartel to an underground Chinese banking group in Southern California. We have over $50 million in drug proceeds laundered through this investigation. Following a multi-year effort by U.S. officials, the Department of Justice announcing charges against 24 people accused of being connected to the cartel. The indictment that we announced today charges Mexican drug cartels and Chinese money laundering groups with partnering together to perpetuate a cycle of destruction in this country. The investigation, dubbed Operation Fortune Runner, uncovered how 45-year-old Edgar Joel Martinez Reyes allegedly ran the sophisticated network. Suspects, some of them Chinese, collected bags of cash from cartel associates in the Los Angeles area. That cash was then deposited into a Chinese bank controlled by a money laundering broker. Investigators say the broker then used that money to purchase goods in China, including precursor chemicals used to make both meth and fentanyl. Chinese associates would then send those purchased goods to Mexico, where they were sold or chemicals further processed into drugs. The cash from both eventually ended up in the hands of the cartel to pay for smuggling drugs to the United States. Martinez Reyes attorneys did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Federal authorities credit China with cooperating with the investigation to make arrests, but Chinese officials still question the extent of their country's involvement. The fentanyl problem is rooted in the U.S. itself, officials say. The U.S. fentanyl crisis started from overprescription and developed due to many complicated factors. Search warrant! Open the door! This is not the first time we are seeing ties between China and cartels. The Chinese criminal organizations have such a desire for U.S. dollars in cash that they're getting into a variety of criminal uh, enterprises to create that cash. A U.S. Treasury official told her own Jacob Sobroff that Chinese criminal organizations then launder money from cartel meth, fentanyl, and other drugs through cash loans, sometimes given to unsuspecting Chinese nationals. By working together, uh, they've been able to get millions, if not billions of dollars out of China into the United States, and they've been able to use a synthetic drug trade to do it. A transcontinental web of crime now coming into focus, but far from being solved. Coming. Our thanks to Morgan Chesky for that report of the 24 people who were indicted, 22 are currently in custody. On Capitol Hill, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are joining forces to combat the rise of deep fake pornography. AI technology is accelerating this alarming trend, which targets everyone from celebrities to innocent school kids. Now lawmakers hope a new act will change that. Our very own Savannah Sellers explains. Texas Republican Ted Cruz and Minnesota Democrat Amy Klobuchar joining together to address the disturbing trend of non-consensual intimate images being shared online, including ones created by artificial intelligence. This is increasingly affecting and targeted at minors. Deep fake porn production up 464% last year. A simple AI technology can make realistic looking explicit images of anyone. 
Actor Jacob Elordi targeted this week in a fake video viewed millions of times. Other stars similarly targeted with face swapping or nudification technology include Emma Watson, Scarlett Johansson, and Taylor Swift. But it's far from just celebrities. I was just thinking, like, this is my photo from my Instagram. Why would there be a body that's not mine on it? Elliston Berry says she was 14 when fake explicit images of her, created by a classmate in her Texas high school, spread via Snapchat. Did it feel like there was anything you could do about it? I felt totally helpless as these images were going around. Snapchat says it has zero tolerance for pornography and encourages the use of its reporting tools. But Barry's mother says it was eight months before the social media platform took action in their case. The new bipartisan bill, known as the Take It Down Act, puts the onus on tech companies, requiring them to remove non-consensual intimate imagery within 48 hours of receiving a credible complaint. And the bill targets individuals, making it a federal crime to publish the images. A crucial step, says legal scholar Marianne Franks. Distribution is important. Yes, the platforms are important, but making sure that any person who is thinking about doing this to another person thinks twice because they might have, have to face really serious consequences, that's key. Innocent victims like Elliston Berry, hopeful help is on the way. Savannah Sellers, NBC News. Innocent victims like Elliston Berry, hopeful help is on the way. Savannah Sellers, NBC News. Coming up, you could call it a high honor after the break, the special Juneteenth flight paying tribute to black veterans. Morning News Now will be right back. Finally this hour, a flight like no other to commemorate Juneteenth, an organization that celebrates America's veterans, hosted its first honor flight, paying tribute to black military service members. NBC News Washington correspondent Yamichelle Sindor has their story. For Rodney and Ruth Walker, celebrating Juneteenth in the nation's capital is historic. I feel honored and I feel appreciated. Both served during the Vietnam War. Rodney as a combat Marine, and Ruth with a job stateside. The two married in 1971. The couple started their day joining some of America's finest heroes. We'll get ready to board. On a trip from Atlanta to Washington, D.C. Their trip, the first of its kind, the Honor Flight Network bringing together these 26 black veterans, paying tribute to those who served and marking the end of slavery in the U.S. Veterans greeted with a water cannon salute and a warm welcome. What's it feel like to be here on Juneteenth as part of this historic flight? First of all, I would have never imagined being here at all, let alone Juneteenth. I'll cherish this moment for the rest of my life. Since 2005, the Honor Flight Network has flown nearly 300,000 veterans into D.C. The group visited a number of war memorials, making a stop at Arlington National Cemetery, laying a wreath with 101-year-old Calvin Kemp, who served in World War II. I broke down in tears. For the walkers, a day of reflection. I've seen other men like me who served their country uh, bravely and, and courageously and with honor. And now they're here and they're celebrating. Yami Shalsandor, NBC News, Washington. Very cool. All right, that's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But stay with us. The news continues right now. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment right now on Morning News Now, a barrage of wild weather battering Americans from coast to coast. Along the Gulf Coast, Tropical Storm Alberto is hammering Texas and parts of Mexico, bringing unrelenting rains to millions. And it's not over yet. Our Michelle Grossman has the storm's latest track in just a moment. Comes as sky high temperatures continue to scorch parts of the Midwest and East Coast. And dangerous wildfires flare in the West. We are covering it all. Also this morning, a legal battle brewing in Louisiana classrooms. The state's Republican governor signing a controversial new law requiring the Ten Commandments be displayed in every public school classroom. We're going to break down all of the challenges to this legislation that are soon to come. Plus, we're learning new details about the high-profile DWI arrest of Justin Timberlake, how his lawyer is now responding, and the legal fight that could be shaping up for the pop star who's still on tour. 
And later in the hour, a Pride Month conversation with the incomparable and hilarious Judy Gold. She's part of a brand new Netflix documentary called Outstanding, a comedy revolution chronicling the LGBTQ plus stand-up scene over the years, their struggles and successes in the limelight. We begin this hour with the latest on the first named storm of the hurricane season, Tropical Storm Alberto. The system is set to make landfall in Mexico this morning. The effects are already being felt all along the Texas Gulf Coast. From heavy flooding to storm surge, officials are preparing for what's ahead. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is in Freeport, Texas, with a closer look at the impact. Sam, good morning. Yeah, Joe, good morning. Things are a bit calmer here this morning, but Governor Abbott did issue a disaster declaration for 51 counties in Texas. That includes Brazoria, where I'm standing, and Alberta right now being blamed for the death of three people in Mexico, Joe. That includes, sadly, two children. As far as what we're seeing on the ground right now, this is a home development, okay, that's completely flooded out. As you can see, there's trash bins still floating in the water this morning. The high tide has brought a lot of those waters up, and we are watching as folks, even now, are having to wade in and out of their own homes. Alberta making a monster splash this morning, kicking off what's predicted to be a record hurricane season. The tropical storm moving over the coast of Mexico, but managing to drench southern Texas and Louisiana in the process. The Texas governor declaring a severe weather disaster as residents like Roy Scott urge neighbors to take the storm seriously. No, no, no. I said, if you go out there in the bay, if you go out there, you're going to die. Vacationers in Freeport, Texas, were greeted by a wall of water at their front door. How high was the water? Uh, thigh high. Yeah, at least mid-thigh. Yeah, it, it and was, it, was, it, was, it was hard. As some tried to evacuate, others opted to run out the storm. Cars and trucks trying to make their way through the blinding rains. The rising waters even prevented ambulances from reaching stranded homes. Trying to get your ambulance into a lot of these neighborhoods, how difficult is it? It's impossible. There are some back there, some houses that are almost completely underwater. Rains were also inundating roadways in Louisiana, like Highway 1 in Lafourche, just the beginning of what's expected to be a powerful and punishing hurricane season. It's actually the expectation, Joe, this morning is that this could be a record-breaking hurricane season, partly due to the fact we have just such strong ocean heat right now. NOAA forecasting in the range of 17 to 25 named storms, 8 to 13 of which are expected to become hurricanes. Back to you. All right, Sam, thank you so much. To the north now, millions of people across the Midwest and East Coast searching for relief as the heat index soars into the 100s. And on the West Coast, firefighters from California to New Mexico are racing to put out some of the worst wildfires they have ever seen. This extreme weather continues as the first day of summer begins. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joining us from Central Park here in New York with more on the dangerous heat. Aaron, how's it feeling out there? Hey, Joel, it's feeling pretty hot. We're seeing dangerous conditions across the country out west. At least two were killed in wildfires in New Mexico. And then here in the northeast, that heat dome continues its dangerous grip with officials warning folks to stay inside and stay safe. This morning, dangerous weather from extreme heat to fires across the country with over 80 million under heat alerts. Please stay in the house, um, stay cool as you can. In the Northeast today, half a dozen cities are forecasted to either meet or exceed record highs. In Bangor, Maine, it's never felt hotter. It's like being slapped in the face. Folks are staying safe any way they can, with shopping malls and churches turned cooling centers. In Connecticut, hundreds crowded the beach. It's crazy, like the only spots open are in the Ocean. At yesterday's Phillies game, misters, water stations, and sunblock dispensers to deal with the scorching temps. Water. Lots of water. <laughs> the Major League team taking every precaution. We've increased medical staff for games this week, especially those games that are during the day. Wild weather also bringing dangerous conditions out west. In New Mexico, strong winds and thunderstorms triggering a massive dust storm called a haboob, dropping visibility to less than a quarter of a mile, causing multi-vehicle crashes. And in the same state, two fast-moving wildfires killed at least two people, scorching more than 23,000 acres, destroying 1,400 structures, prompting a state of emergency and the evacuation of thousands of residents in Rio Doso, about 150 miles southeast of Albuquerque. Officials say the severe weather could affect firefighting efforts. We have two devastating 
enormous fires. And when I say enormous, it means that they're getting more and more complicated to address. Back here in New York City, it's expected to be another scorcher. I was talking to a spokesperson for the New York Fire Department. He was telling me they have seen an uptick in the number of emergency calls, and they don't usually see that uptick until day three, day four of a heat wave. So he said that they're preparing for even more calls today, people looking for help in this heat. Joe. Right. Aaron, thank you so much. Let's get a check now on your morning news now. Weather meteorologist Michelle Grossman keeping an eye on all of it. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Yeah, and the heat remains a big weather headline and will remain uh, through the weekend into early next week because we are still looking at temperatures in the 90s. You factor in the humidity in some spots. It feels like well over 100 degrees. So again, that summer sizzler does uh, continue. Summer arrives a little bit later today. We have the chance for severe storms later on today, mainly tonight into Friday along this boundary here. It's kind of on the upper tier of this bubble of high pressure, a uh, flooding risk to mainly tonight into Friday in portions of the northern plains into the upper Midwest. And then as we we head down to the south. Tropical storm Alberto made its way inland. It's going to dissipate further as it goes throughout the day. We're looking at scattered showers, much better conditions in Texas for the rest of the day. We do have some showers this morning, some spots of heavy rain, but most of the heaviest rain has moved into Mexico. Could see that tropical moisture move into portions of the southwest. We're looking at lots of sunshine along the west coast into the Pacific Northwest. Let's talk about summer. I know it's felt like summer for days, but it does not officially arrive until 420 this afternoon. Uh, so we'll see the longest day, the most day of day longest day with daylight today and that's because the sun is directly over the uh, tropic of cancer so there's that earth spinning and it's going to be a very hot day feeling much like summer and it's going to continue to feel like summer and models indicating that we're going to be above average in the east uh, for this month into july so 65 million people impacted by heat alerts as we go throughout the rest of this thursday we have heat advisories heat watches heat warnings major cities like detroit pittsburgh philadelphia boston into bangor seeing those really high temperatures once again, well above normal for this time of year. And as Aaron mentioned, it's prolonged. We're not getting that relief at night as well, and that's why it's so tough on our bodies as it goes on and on and then not getting that relief. Bangor, you were into uh, feeling like 106 yesterday. You're going to feel like the triple digits once again today. That is the heat index. 103 is what it will feel like today in Bangor. Boston, you're going to feel like 94. Actually, a little uh, cooler than it will feel like on your body compared to the air temperature. Everywhere else, we're going to be feeling hotter. 96 is what it will feel like in Buffalo. Same story in Pittsburgh. Same story in Indianapolis. Feeling like 95 there. We'll keep that heat dome in place tomorrow because we're going to see those temperatures soaring once again. We're looking at near triple digits in St. Louis as your air temperature 97, 95 in D.C., 92 degrees in New York City. It's going to feel like 95 tomorrow, and that's going to stay throughout the weekend as well. So no relief with all the kids, football games, baseball games, soccer games. It's going to be a hot one. You need to hydrate. We're looking at temperatures well into the 90s, near 100 degrees on Saturday. Also Sunday in St. Louis. Same story in Philadelphia, 97 on Saturday. Sunday looking at 98 degrees. It's a little cool down. 91 degrees on Monday. Still very hot. Flood alert still for 2 million people. This will last through Thursday because we're looking at still some scattered showers throughout uh, southern Texas, but much better than where we were yesterday or even overnight into early this morning. Additional rainfall anywhere from a half inch to an inch, mainly in western Texas. That would be Laredo. Um, and then seeing some tropical moisture streaming into portions of the southwest. A flash flood risk. It's uh, minimizing as we go throughout this morning here. Corpus Christi into Brownsville. The real threat that this morning into the later part of today will be in the northern plains into the upper Midwest. We are looking at training storms could see three inches per hour. And uh, Joe, your hometown, Minneapolis, looking at some really heavy rain today, especially tonight into tomorrow. Just rain everywhere, heat everywhere. Yeah. Busy, busy day. All right, Michelle, as always, thank you. Sure. The White House is pushing back against accusations by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who said the Biden administration is withholding weapons intended for Israel. Netanyahu made the claims in a video on Tuesday, which the U.S. disputes. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley joins us from Jerusalem. Matt, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Yeah, it's another sign of that increasingly acrimonious relationship between the Biden administration and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Axios reported that the White House was enraged after Netanyahu released a video scolding the U.S. for not coming through on weapons deliveries. A new war of words breaking out between Washington and Jerusalem after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu accused the U.S. of not sending promised weapons to Israel. It's inconceivable. That in the past few months, the administration has been withholding weapons and ammunitions to Israel. 
Israel, America's closest ally, fighting for its life. During World War II, Churchill told the United States, give us the tools, we'll do the job. And I say, give us the tools and we'll finish the job a lot faster. The White House's response also coming quick and sharp. Let me just start off by saying that we generally do not know what he's talking about. Uh, we just don't. There had already been tension over a previously delayed shipment of bombs to Israel over U.S. concerns they might be used to kill civilians in Rafah. As you know, are continuing to review one shipment, but everything else is moving as it normally would move. The White House denied reports that it had canceled a meeting with Israeli officials over the video, but U.S. officials told NBC News they were reluctant to reward Netanyahu with the meeting and that it had been postponed. And more pressure for Netanyahu this morning after the main IDF spokesperson seemed to contradict the prime minister's goal of defeating Hamas, saying overnight, anyone who thinks we can eliminate Hamas is wrong, adding that the idea that it can be destroyed without new leadership being installed in Gaza is throwing sand in the eyes of the public. The government saying this morning that the IDF is committed to destroying Hamas. And Joe, we're seeing more attacks in the Red Sea. The British military saying that a Greek-owned ship that those Yemeni-based Houthi rebels had attacked several days ago has sunk. And this comes despite a months-long effort led by the U.S. to try to make that region safer for international shipping. Joe. All right, Matt, thank you so much. Louisiana is now the first state to require that every public school classroom display the Ten Commandments in the classroom. The bill was signed into law by the state's Republican governor Wednesday. It mandates that a poster-sized display of the commandments in a, quote, large, easily readable font will be shown in all public classrooms from kindergarten to state-funded universities. Civil Liberties groups vow to challenge the move, saying, quote, the law violates the separation of church and state and is blatantly unconstitutional. Joining us now for more on this is Kristen gibbons Fedden. She's an NBC News contributor, civil rights attorney and former prosecutor. Kristen, good to have you with us. So advocates for the law say that its purpose is not only religious, but also for historical significance. According to the law's language, the commandments are described as foundational documents akin to the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and that they'll be accompanied by a context statement that says the commandments were part of American public education for almost three centuries. There's the language. Is that enough to head off any legal action and actually defend themselves against that legal action? It may not, but it's a good try. You know, the framing, basically what the um, proponents are saying is that the framing is for a secular purpose. And Joe, why is that important? It's because if it's for a secular purpose to teach history, then it is not solely to promote religion. So that will help defend it against the opponents who will raise challenges, constitutional challenges, saying that it violates the Establishment Clause of the Constitution. The Establishment Clause of the Constitution prohibits the government, and that would be the state legislators, from unduly favoring one religion over others, and also it prohibits the government from promoting religion in general. I think some of the other things that the proponents will say is that they're not using state funding in order to create these posters or displays, um, and so they're trying to try to separate themselves from the government focus. But I think the opponents' arguments are going to be strong against it, because there is some very strong arguments that it is unduly favoring one religion over the other, or at the very minimum, promoting other religions. So let's talk more about that. No surprise, civil liberties groups plan to sue. So they're saying the bill violates the First Amendment. They also say there's a 1980 ruling from the Supreme Court that overturned a similar statute that was approved in Kentucky. So walk us through more of the arguments you expect them to make. Yeah, exactly. So that 1980s decision, Joe, the Stone v. Graham decision, actually struck down, as you mentioned, a similar Kentucky law. So that one required the posting of the Ten Commandments in public classrooms, just like what we see here. And again, they argued that it violated the Establishment Clause. But what the proponents in this particular case are saying is, no, we've added that additional historical context. We have separated ourselves from the governmental purpose or promotion of the religion because we are not asking for state funding. We're actually going to get donations. And that's how they're trying to distinguish it from the Stone v. Graham or the Kentucky opponents and proponents of that, which, as you noted, the Stone v. Graham was struck down as unconstitutional. So they're arguing in this particular case, Louisiana is saying, we have that added context. And so we are actually showing that this, these, uh, the Ten Commandments in this case actually has a secular historical purpose and there are, there are non 
religious reasons for promoting this uh, poster so, or this oh, legislation. Yeah. So over the last 50, 60 years, we know the major issues before the Supreme Court have been civil rights, abortion access, gun cases, and also school prayer. So we're now approaching the two-year anniversary of the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe versus Wade. Looking at this law, first, do you think the Supreme Court might get involved if it gets that high? And do you think perhaps that could be the reason why Louisiana and the lawmakers passed this law, hoping that maybe they would be able to overcome any legal challenges? I absolutely think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, the current political climate right now in Louisiana, uh, with the strong conservative leadership and the Republican majority, it does make it easier to pass these types of laws. Uh, I also think that, you know, this, the research shows that Louisiana, many people actually support integrating religious uh, principles into their public life. So this also aligns with their constituents' beliefs. So, and then when you add SCOTUS, the conservative majority on the U.S. Supreme Court really has recently favored religious expression in schools and encouraged lawmakers to pass this. So absolutely agree with you. I think it's going to the Supreme Court and it may actually withhold constitutional challenge. All right. Kristen gibbons and appreciate your analysis. Thanks for joining us this morning. Much more to come on this hour on Morning News Now, including what Justin Timberlake's lawyer is now saying about the singer's high-profile arrest on Long Island earlier this week. But first, detained abroad, an American ballerina on trial in Russia after being accused of treason. How long she could spend behind bars thousands of miles from home. Those stories and much more next. Welcome back. A Los Angeles-based ballerina detained in Russia went on trial earlier this morning. Russian-American dual citizen Ksenia Kar Karolina was detained in January, charged with treason after she gave money to a Ukrainian charity. NBC News chief international correspondent Kier Simmons joins us with more on this. Kier, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. It's just more agony for Ksenia Karolina and uh, her the people close to her back home in California because this morning her trial started for a few minutes and then was postponed because the court said of procedural issues. And last year, the charge that she faces, the sentence for that, if she was found guilty, the charge of treason was increased to, max, to, to a lifetime in prison. This morning, our first glimpse of American Ksenia Karelina in months. Casually dressed, sitting in the dock, managing something of a smile. Karelina in court for her trial in Ekaterinburg, Russia. Only to learn she will wait longer. The case postponed until August. A long way from her life in California. An amateur ballerina who became a U.S. citizen and, friends say, was only in Russia to visit her elderly mother. The 33-year-old charged with treason because, her boyfriend says, she donated just $51.80 to a Ukrainian charity. In a statement overnight, he told NBC News she is an innocent young woman with her whole life ahead of her. She is full of compassion and donated a small amount to a U.S. nonprofit to help people in need. She is not an activist for any cause. Expressing the hope the court will see that prosecuting her is a mistake and send her home to Los Angeles. She joins a growing list of American citizens imprisoned in Russia, including Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich, whose trial begins next week, facing the same judge as Ksenia Karelina. His newspaper says he is innocent. The U.S. says he is wrongfully detained. President Putin this morning in Vietnam after a visit to Kim Jong-un in North Korea, signing more strategic partnership agreements, has said talks are underway to exchange Gershkovich following the 2022 deal for WNBA star Brittany Griner, who was freed in a prisoner swap after time in a penal colony she says she will never forget. And that news, Joe, that Evan Gershkovich will face the same judge as Ksenia Karolina, but that, that will be noted by his uh, friends and family. The fact that the case today started and then stopped so quickly, perhaps a warning to them to prepare themselves emotionally, Joe. All right, Kira, thank you so much. More international headlines now. In Ecuador, a major blackout left some 18 million people in the dark. NBC's Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and other world news. Claudio, good morning. 
Good morning, Joe. That's right. At least 18 million people were left in the dark on Wednesday all across Ecuador after the country experienced nationwide electricity outage. Now, the problem affected also the capital, Quito, including its subway system, which has been interrupted. The electricity crisis is caused by a combination of a drought that has affected hydroelectric power generators and heavy rains over the weekend that forced the authorities to take three hydroelectric plants offline. And let's come back to this part of the world, to the Vatican, where one of the defendants in a big financial trial there claimed his human rights were violated after Pope Francis authorized wide-ranging surveillance during the investigation. The defendant, called Raffaele Mincione, filed a complaint to the United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights, citing four secret executive decrees signed by Pope Francis that allowed Vatican prosecutors the use of unchecked wiretapping. The trial focused on the Holy See's investment in a London property worth around $375 million. that resulted in massive losses for the Vatican. And let's end this tour of the world in the Australian island state of Tasmania, where authorities advertised a series of very odd jobs to boost tourism during its winter months. Among the job titles, you can find Paranormal Investigator, which involves picking up on paranormal activity using ghost hunting techniques, or you can apply for the position of Wombat Walker, which speaks for itself. Another job is an Oyster Organizer, which entails a sorting, cleaning, and categorizing freshly harvested oysters and my all-time favorite stargazer now the positions are unpaid but travel expenses will be will be covered by the tourism board there back to you john wombat Apply walker away. do wombats use leashes hmm. yeah. right. Mario, <laughs> thank you so much right coming up new details in the hamptons arrest of jumper justin timberlake this morning what the singer's lawyer is now saying about the charges brought against him that's next In the two years since Florida passed its controversial so-called don't say gay law, even more states have passed copycat laws. Now, maybe you haven't heard about them because a lot of the backlash is coming from a local level, spurred by groups of parents and grassroots organizers. Armora Barrett went to North Carolina, where hundreds joined a federal complaint against a state law that they say fails to protect transgender kids. It was the Florida fight over schools that captivated the nation. Republicans pushing through the parental rights and education law, dubbed Don't Say Gay by opponents. Now, two years later, several states swiftly and without much fanfare passed their own laws replicating Florida as part of a flurry of anti-LGBTQ bills introduced in red state houses. The laws across 11 states limit instruction around sexual orientation or gender identity in schools. This legislation codifies the rights of parents and guardians and creates a system for remedies for parents wishing to address concerns. In North Carolina, it goes a step further, including a provision that requires teachers to notify parents of pronoun changes, which advocates say effectively outs trans students, something that worries 17-year-old Milo, who is trans. I have multiple friends who, like, if their parents found out that they were trans, they would probably get kicked out of their house. Experts contrast the lack of national attention with the widespread backlash to the state's trans bathroom bill in 2016, which was later repealed. And that's why we're seeing these laws happen in a dozen states or 20 states at once, because half the country can't be boycotted. Do you worry that it indicates a sense of acceptance of these types of laws? We're seeing parents get a lot more politically engaged. Love is love. Stacey Staggs is one of those parents. Parents. This law was designed to allow hate and anger and to discriminate against people for things they don't have any control over. She says her children's school district is in overcompliance of the law, canceling the subscription to an entire online library database of tens of thousands of books over just a handful of titles in question. The state's Department of Public Instruction, which oversees schools, did not address the book bans, but noted the legislation advises educators against alerting parents about a name or pronoun change if it could result in abuse or neglect. How concerned are you about the scope of your your child's education. I don't want to cry. Uh, <clears throat> it keeps me up at night. I mean, we've seen more instances of kids calling each other names, uh, physical fights, um, intimidation and bullying.
Some of those instances highlighted in a 113-page Title IX federal complaint that Stag, alongside dozens of students, parents, and teachers, gave testimony for, challenging the state law. As they wait for the review, trans students like Noah and Milo want to show lawmakers that students like them aren't a threat, but the laws in place are. This is like the time in your life where like you sort of figure out who you are. And so without having like the safety or like feeling kind of threatened by these new laws is like not good. Things are kind of awful right now. But the best thing we can do is just keep living. It's a fascinating counterpoint that we're seeing as these conservative groups have this national effort via Moms for Liberty, for example, opposing grassroots groups are emerging to fight back as well. The Campaign for Southern Equality has templates on its website for other school districts looking to file Title IX complaints. They also have speaker's guides for any parents that might want to speak out at school board meetings. And so it's kind of a training, if you will, to fight back against the culture wars. Now, I should also note that I did reach out to the North Carolina Republican lawmakers that introduced the original bill, but did not hear back. Back to you. All right, Maura, thank you so much. In other legal news, we're learning new details this morning from the night that pop star Justin Timberlake was arrested in the Hamptons for suspicion of driving under the influence. The singer's attorney is speaking out for the first time as new video surfaces from the night of the incident. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung is here with the latest. Kaylee, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. So Justin Timberlake told police that he had one martini before he was pulled over, failed a field sobriety test, and was arrested. Now his lawyer says he is looking forward to vigorously defending these allegations against him, which sure makes it look like the 10-time Grammy winner is ready for a legal battle right in the middle of his world tour. In the days since Justin Timberlake was arrested and charged with driving while intoxicated, the spotlight on the singer is intensifying. This morning, new surveillance video appears to show a vehicle that matches the description of the one Timberlake was driving, heading in the direction where he was pulled over by police. Sag Harbor PD have not responded to NBC News's request to confirm the vehicle in the video is Timberlake's. All the good girls. The pop superstar so far staying silent on the matter, letting his lawyer weigh in. I will have a lot to say at the appropriate time, but am currently awaiting full discovery from the district attorney's office. The 43-year-old was seen Monday night at the American Hotel, a Hamptons establishment frequented by celebrities. Police say they pulled him over just after midnight in a BMW after he failed to stop at this stop sign and swerved in two different places. According to court documents, an officer determined Timberlake was intoxicated, struggling to walk heel to toe and stand on one foot without swaying or using arms to balance. Timberlake told the officers he had one martini and refused to take a breathalyzer test three times, according to documents. He was arrested and released about nine hours later without having to post bail. This comes in the middle of the 10-time Grammy winner's world tour. He was last on stage Saturday in Miami and is expected tomorrow in Chicago giving no indication these legal troubles will affect his upcoming schedule. But just as he kicks off the European leg of the tour on July 26th, he'll face his next court hearing. The singer likely joining the virtual proceedings from Krakow, Poland, where he'll perform that night. His wife, actress Jessica Biel, spotted in nearby New York City this week, shooting her latest project. Last month, Beale addressed the challenges of their busy schedules. And when he has his breaks, he'll we'll, we'll hang out yeah. and try to do something that's relaxing and fun. He, I mean, he has to relax. Like, he really right. has to relax. So just as we say, it looks like Timberlake's world tour won't be affected. Of course, there are potential consequences to discuss here. So, Joe, if convicted, he could face up to a year in jail. We've talked to legal experts who say that's unlikely. What's more likely for a first-time offender is a fine, community service and I mean, his driver's license suspended. Got it. Of course, a long way to go before that. All right. Kaylee, thanks so much. Appreciate your update there. Coming up, a major scare for one family playing out just as summer starts to heat up. After the break, the dramatic poolside rescue caught on camera and how you can keep yourself and your family safe in the water this season. Stay with us. We're back now with a terrifying close call for one California family. New video shows a father saving his two-year-old daughter's life with CPR after she nearly drowned in their family pool. It is a reminder to parents just how critical water safety is, especially this time of year. Here with more is NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky. Morgan, good morning. 
And Joe Perrin or not, as soon as you see this video, you can't help but be reminded how critical CPR is when it comes to saving a person's life. And now with school already out in many parts of the country, pools, beach, beaches, and lakes already filling up fast. But as one family can attest, it just took a few seconds for fun of the sun to take a potentially deadly turn. I never, ever in my life thought that would happen at my pool with my kids. A family's worst nightmare unfolding in their North Carolina backyard. Gaston County 911. Oh, yes, uh, we, we, the kid fell in the pool. Uh, the baby fell in the pool. Two year old Mila Shortridge swimming with her siblings and friends. Have it fun on Memorial Day. When a fun weekend became a fight for survival. I actually was sitting like in this very spot right here and Mila's father Matthew says he was keeping a close eye on the pool when he briefly turned away home surveillance video captured what happened next I heard my 10 year old daughter Adeline uh, scream out my younger daughter's name Mila like that and I knew immediately that blood curdling scream what that meant I saw my daughter Mila floating in the pool with her head down and her arms like this I immediately jumped into the pool Matthew and his wife Amy, both medical professionals, are also CPR certified. I immediately started mouth to mouth. I started breathing in her mouth, and my friend immediately started chest compressions. I heard a cry, and I heard her try to cough. And when I heard that, my heart just filled with joy so much that she was saved and she was alive. Mila survived, but the CDC says drowning remains the leading cause of death for children ages one through four. And that number's on the rise, spiking by 28% between 2019 and 2022. Which is why safety experts say layers of protection are crucial, starting with supervision. Have adults take turns being the designated water watcher. And in public, always check for lifeguards and where they're stationed. Next, barriers. Residential pools need a fence and self-locking gate. And consider alarms on doors that lead outside. And finally, get CPR certified. It's vitally important to do breaths as well to make sure that oxygen is getting to the brain. We have minutes when we're talking about a child who's been in the water or anybody for that matter. Experts say with the right knowledge and training, lives just like Mila's can be saved. She spent one night in a hospital, but since then, has made a full recovery. Her parents and sister hoping their story helps others. Everybody needs to be around their little, little sister or brother that can't swim well. I want everyone possible to know CPR because it really does save lives. Yeah, it can make such a big difference when those seconds absolutely count. And we did speak to an expert on other tips before you head down to the water here, Joe. They say with when you go to anywhere, make sure you have the buddy system in place. And that's even if a lifeguard is present. Also, consider having your kids in bright colors, not just if it's easier for you to identify them, but also a lifeguard as well, spotting them in a time of emergency. Be aware of weather and water conditions, waves and currents, not just an issue in oceans, but also fresh water as well. All of those great tips before we head out for this summer. And a special thanks to WCNC and Charlotte for alerting us to this important story here. Definitely Joe. some important information there. And thanks to that family for sharing their story. Morgan, thank you. Let's stick with the summer theme here as we kick off the first official day of the season. And AAA is predicting a record number of Americans, more than 70 million, will travel for the July 4th holiday this year. So what do you need to know before heading out and locking in those travel plans? Here to give us some answers, NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung. This seems to be a theme this summer that travel is up. So why are people traveling more? How are they getting where they're going? Where are they going? Yeah, and happy summer, Joe. And when it comes to the reason for why AAA is projecting a record amount of travelers to go over 50 miles for July 4th week, it's saying because of, uh, look, the combination of uh, remote work in addition to just excitement over, uh, again, this post-pandemic period of being able to catch up on experiences. So what are we talking about here? Again, uh, prices are generally lower, which uh, you know is certainly welcome news if you're trying to rent a car or even if you're buying a plane tickets because prices are down as well on that front. Of 
of course, depending on your itinerary. But some of the popular destinations, by the way, for this particular July 4th, uh, Seattle, Washington, as well as Orlando, Florida, and international, we're talking about Vancouver, as well as London. And Seattle and Vancouver, I want to point out, are major hubs for cruises to Alaska, people trying to maybe yep. use July 4th to go up north to stay cool. I used to live in Seattle. Seattle in July is awesome, by the <laughs> way. And also, I think when you get 4th of July, it's on a Thursday when it's in the middle of the week. I think people are just like, well, just take the whole week off. Might, as well. Gonna be Might as well. Let's talk about prices, especially gas prices. Yeah, so gas prices, because uh, AAA is projecting that over 60 million will be traveling by car. Uh, gas prices right now, $3.44. That's down 14 cents compared to last year, according to updated numbers that we've just got this morning. And when it comes to uh, prices at the pump, that's also going to be welcome news for those that are renting cars. I mentioned that just now. Uh, prices, according to the government, are down almost 9% compared to last year. That could give you a little more padding in your wallet. Some good news there. All right, Brian Chung, thanks so much. Appreciate it. More financial headlines now. The latest read on employment just dropping this morning. CNBC Silvana Hanau has those numbers and other money headlines. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. Yep, we are getting, we are just getting a fresh look at the economy. Jobless claims, the, that's the number of Americans applying for unemployment benefits. It slipped last week. As the U.S. labor market remains resilient, the Labor Department reporting that jobless claims fell to 238,000 from a 10-month high of 243,000 the week before. Our right, AT&T is raising prices for customers who are on old unlimited data plans that have been retired. Starting in August, their bills will rise by up to $20 for plans with multiple lines. Customers with a single line will see charges go up by $10 a month. Now, AT&T says that it's offering more high-speed data and hotspots in exchange for the price hike, which would let customers keep their old plans that have been grandfathered in. AT&T's current unlimited plans, those range from $65.99 to $85.99 a month for a single line. And celebrate the summer solstice with some cool deals on the first day of summer. Buffalo, Buffalo Wild Wings is giving rewards members a free order of buffalo wings when they buy one today. Sonic is offering its new groovy fries with groovy sauce for $1. Supermarket giant Kroger is giving away 45,000 pints of free Kroger brand ice cream today while supplies last. Now, that's 50 pints per minute for 900 minutes in all, or that's the total of sunlight we'll get in the Northern Hemisphere today. And you can get a digital coupon for the offer online at freekrogericecream.com, Joe. All right, Silvana, thank you so much. You got it. Let's stick with business. And when it comes to those plastic air pillows and Amazon packages, which some of us love to pop, the online retail giant is bursting the bubble. Amazon says it plans to remove all of the pillows from delivery packages by the end of the year. For a company of this size, that is a huge change. Joining us now from an Amazon warehouse in Baltimore is CNBC's senior climate correspondent, Diana Olick. Diana, good morning. So, I mean, given the sheer size of Amazon, just how big of a transition will this be? Well, good morning, Joe. Yeah, after extensive testing with employees, consumers, and third-party analysts, Amazon put into motion one of its most ambitious sustainability efforts. Yes, they're saying goodbye to this and hello to this. It's Amazon's largest plastic packaging reduction in North America so far. Recycled paper is replacing the 15 billion plastic pillows used every year. They're difficult to recycle because, first of all, you have to pop them. You have to pop it. And they can't go in a curbside recycling bin. Paper may also just work better than plastic. This paper is a little bit softer. It's made with 100 recycled content, post-industrial as well as post-consumer industrial recycled content. And that allows the, the items to kind of cushion in there rather than bounce. In addition to losing plastic, Amazon is using AI to right-size its packages by eliminating empty space in boxes. So it's an investment across automation, it's an investment across material science, as well as machine learning and artificial intelligence. Change protects the environment on the consumer and what does it do behind the scenes? I mean, how big of a change will this be for the systems that actually prepare the package? 
Well, it's a huge change, Joe. Look, we asked Linder how much the transition will actually end up costing Amazon. He wouldn't say exactly, only that some plastic bags, these are less expensive than paper. But the new technology, by simplifying the process and automating and right-sizing packaging, he said it allows Amazon to bring that cost difference down. But it's going to be a big transition. It's taking a year, but they do expect it to be done by the end of this year. You also mentioned Amazon will be implementing AI in their systems more. So what is that going to do? How will it help? Well, it's like, you know, when you get the big box from Amazon and there's one thing in it and there's all this space and then you get, you know, two things in a big box or you get a small box with a big... It's that they want to be able to right size it. That is, get rid of the extra space. And by using artificial intelligence to really look into the boxes, how they're packaged, how they're sent, what they can do, they want to get it so that you have as little packaging on each package, still protected, but as little packaging as possible. Because, you know, again, they want to, you want to click that one where it says put as many items in the same box. We all want to do that. We all want to save on the packaging. But again, it's that right sizing so you don't have so much of the paper even around it to be wasted. All right. Diana Olick, important story. Thank you so much. Coming up, a comedian who is the definition of being proud out loud. After the break, we are continuing our Pride Month celebrations with the hilarious Judy Gold. She's part of a brand new Netflix documentary called Outstanding, a Comedy Revolution, all about LGBTQ plus, LGBTQ plus comics through the years. We're going to chat about that and so much more after the break. You are an excellent Vanna White there, Judy. This is Morning News Now. Our celebration of Pride Month continues with our series Proud Out Loud, focusing on trailblazers in the LGBTQ plus community. This morning, we are joined by a comedy legend, Judy Gold. Her stand-up specials have appeared on HBO, Comedy Central, and Logo. She's also an author and host of the podcast It's Judy Show with Judy Gold. Now, she is featured in the new Netflix documentary, Outstanding, A Comedy Revolution, which chronicles the history of stand-up comedy in the LGBTQ plus community. Community, the many obstacles and also the successes. Here's a look. Hello, my queers! Queer people taught America to stop being scared of us by making jokes. It's been such a journey. There's a lot of people who've come before us. Queer comics, queer history, that all deserves to be talked about. Now is the time where people can. And Judy Gold is with us now. Thank you so much for joining oh, us to my talk pleasure. about this. I loved this documentary. It just came out Tuesday. We watched it Tuesday night. And I learned so much. As I didn't even know about Robin yep. Tyler, who was the first out lesbian on national TV back in 1979. What should we know about these trailblazers who were out and proud before most people were? Well, I, you know... I, I love Robin Tyler. Let's start with that. The, the, so brave. But I think the thing that you really get from this documentary, besides this really intimate history and, uh, and, and, and understanding the power of comedy, the power of stand-up comedy, that it is something that sues us, but it's also a weapon for change, that... If you watch the documentary, you see it goes from shoulder to shoulder to shoulder to shoulder, that we are standing on the people who came before us shoulders and um, how important that was because it wasn't easy and it was dangerous. So it, it's just the journey is so interesting because we, most people don't look at stand-up comedy as an art form mm -hmm. that changes the world. But it is an art form that can change the world, can change your mind, and can make you think out of the box. And nor do people maybe think of it as something that can be dangerous. But in this situation, it certainly was for people. You, you talk in the documentary about your own evolution, how at first you kind of wanted to be a comedian who just happened to be a lesbian. Right. And then that kind of had to change, right? It had to change for me because, well, first of all, I started out in the straight clubs. Mm -hmm. And I was working uh, purely in the straight clubs. And then I sort of ventured into the, the gay clubs because greatest they're the greatest audiences mm -hmm. i can't even tell you um and 
Once I had a child, my, my um, el eldest son, Henry, was born in 1996, and I thought to myself, every comic talks about their family on stage, and what kind of message is it to my kids if I say, oh, well, I talk about everyone else, but, you know, we, we don't talk about that on stage because it's going to have a negative effect or whatever. And they were so, when you have a child and you see the world through their eyes, and by the way, when you see a comedian get on stage and talk about their life uh, and how they navigate the world, that's also seeing the world through someone else's eyes. But when you see a kid who doesn't understand, wait, why are we different? What, wait, you can't get married because why? Like, the, you know, it it changes who you are. And it really, truly made me an activist. Let's talk about one of my favorite quotes from the doc. I wrote it down, comes from you. You say, comedy gives people the opportunity to see the world yes. through someone else's eyes. And a great comedian will make you laugh and make you think and maybe even change your mind. What is it you hope folks can learn from this documentary? Uh, I hope people can learn that we went through a lot to get to where we are now. And you know, a lot of times when I think about what people can learn, I think about the young LGBTQ plus community and how they need to know the history, that we didn't get here uh, so that you can speak freely. Uh, and to, I mean, walking into a comedy club now and seeing a gay or trans or non-binary comic on stage and there's not, no negative reaction, mm -hmm. you know, that's not the way it was. So I just want people to appreciate, especially our community, how difficult it was, how lucky we are at this point, and that people are trying to go back and we cannot let them go back. I mean, they're banning books, they're trying to silence people. We cannot go there. Comedy can be a weapon for good, but this documentary also shows how over the years it can be a weapon against the LGBTQ plus community, especially recently with high profile comedians telling transphobic jokes. What do you do about that? Because you are a huge opponent of cancel culture. Right. So you don't want that. So how do we tackle that issue? Well, I've always fought back using comedy. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I don't understand th that really boggles my mind about that an the anti-trans comedy is why? I mean, it, like, you, there's so much to talk about, and that's what you decide to write your comedy about. Um, we have to fight back with truth and with humor. That's how we've gotten to where we are now. Because when you when someone makes you laugh, you like them mm -hmm. immediately and something switches in their brain, they're like, oh, I like that person, and, <laughs> and they're blank, they're disabled, they're gay, they're a person of color, you know. And that's how change happens. That's exactly how change happens. All right, Judy Gold, thank you so much. And, and what stood out to me watching this documentary, especially when we look at recent years, is how many LGBTQ comedians there are right now. There are so many who represent every aspect of the yes. community. And I think that's just a beautiful yeah. thing. The documentary is called Outstanding, A Comedy Revolution. It is out now on Netflix. Please take an hour and a half to check it out. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.